My name is Emily Bossen, and I am an English teacher at Darien High School and the teacher for the Ninth Grade Achievers Program. The Ninth Grade Achievers Program is the final step in the gifted and talented program in Darien called IDEA. Students in this program work on independent projects of their own design for the duration of the year. Tonight you will hear from Sophie, Brenna, Lily, and Desi about their final projects as well as the process they took to get there. I hope you enjoy. This is my Achievers Project. So hi, I'm Sophie Xu. I'm a fourth year IDEA student and I started IDEA in sixth grade. I'm interested in art, education, and filming photography, and I'm a self-proclaimed ambassador for Chinese culture. I first got kind of inspiration for my project in the summers because every single summer I go back to China and I teach students there. Sometimes I teach at summer camps and I've also interned at I One Talk, which is an online English education company. I learned a lot about how to teach online there. And I also got some inspiration from the Chinese social media. Originally, I was like, I want to do art therapy because that was something new that I was interested in. But I realized that I didn't really know where to go from there. So I decided that educational videos was something that I was more familiar with and I could do more with it. In the beginning, I wanted to make three hand-drawn animations using an app. I didn't know which one yet and I also wanted to film three vlogs. As time went on, I realized that animations are really time consuming to make. And so I decided to cut down to two animations and I also couldn't quite find an app that I liked. So I just thought that I'd draw the photos and then put them all in iMovie and just put it all together. Mr. Crowder also said that I could add some creepy audio or something and that would make it really higher quality. I also thought that I would film three vlogs and I decided that they would be about American holidays because Christmas was coming and Thanksgiving was coming and I just thought that it would be the perfect time to film. Quarantine really saved my project. I wasn't doing too well on time management. The animation drawings were taking way longer than I thought that they would. So without quarantine, I might not have finished my animations. When quarantine really hit, I just sat down and I just spent like six hours a day doing them. And I finished them pretty quickly. It was really, it really helped me. I also originally wanted to add a fourth vlog that was a day in the life of a high school student in America. But since school closed, I couldn't quite do that. So I just decided to do an e-learning edition. This is the technology that I used. I used iMovie, Autodesk Sketchbook, and Google Docs. iMovie, for obvious reasons, was my video production, and I learned a lot of new tricks on there. Autodesk Sketchbook was where I drew my, all my drawings for my animations, and I still use it today for everything, I guess. <laughs> Google Docs is where I wrote my scripts, and I also just did a lot of my planning on there. To make the educational videos, I first started out with an idea. For the animations, I decided some creepy American folklore would do it. And how I came to that was actually a pretty funny story. I texted my old students and I was like, hey guys, what were you interested in? Like, what did I teach you that you liked? And one kid texts me, he goes, I really like those cannibal st cannibalism stories you told me. And I was like, great, I don't really want to teach about cannibalism because those kids had begged for those stories but I was not keen on repeating them. So I decided that creepy American folklore would be just right. I also decided that for my vlogs I would need to find other people to be in them or I would have to figure out the logistics, things like privacy and things like that. Step two for the animations was just drawing. I probably spent the longest there for my animations. For vlogs, it was just a few hours of filming, with nothing too bad. Next, I would just put everything together in iMovie. I also had to go online and find a lot of royalty-free audio for my animations, which took a while. When everything was pretty much set, I just had to do some minor tweaking, tweaking and add subtitles, and then I was done. These are some of my favorite drawings that I've done. In the bottom right corner, you see this horse, which has the headless horseman on top. This was probably one of my first ones, and I'm pretty proud of it. 
it's pretty different because I only used one reference photo and I changed some things up as compared to this one on the left where I found five or six reference photos. It was one of my favorites because it was just so much fun. I think I found like five different photos of bushes and I had to find that one perfect photo of a guy falling into a bush. And I took a lot of artistic um, thing, turns with that one. That was fun. The most challenging part was definitely filming. I didn't really know how to film before, so Mr. Crowder definitely helped me a lot. I learned how to use tripods and I learned about camera angles and lighting issues and all of that. For, I also learned how to navigate iMovie and this was mostly through trial and error, but it was really interesting to kind of see how everything worked out. Even though we learned about it in eighth grade, I'd never used it on the iPad before, so it was still a bit different. The least challenging was definitely writing the scripts and translating because I had the whole internet to help me and my mom definitely corrected me a lot too. Drawing was extremely tedious, but I wouldn't say it was very challenging. Even if it was challenging, I'd say it was the most welcome challenge because it was an area that I was familiar with. This is a shout out to everyone who has helped me thus far. Thank you to Mr. Crowther for being an amazing mentor. You helped me with so much about just filming in general and I learned so much from you. Thank you, Ms. Matowski, for your continuous encouragement and support no matter what I'm doing and also helping me with helping me to make my videos a lot more professional than they used to be. Thank you, Ms. Boston, Lily, Debrenna, and Desi for your support throughout everything and also just always watching everything and being there for me. And thanks to my mom for translating because my Chinese would be a mess without you. The, I'm going to show you guys two video ex excerpts. This one is from The Legend of the Headless Horseman, which is one of the two animations that I made. The second one is The Legend of Bloody Mary. You can find the full version of this and also the rest of my videos on the Achievers uh, Project website. It was a cold, snowy evening. A kapod crane left the tavern in town and started walking home. He walked next to the old Sleepy Hollow Cemetery. This was where the headless soldier was buried. Ichabod felt nervous. Rumors had it that at night, the sound of a galloping horse could be heard, but nothing could be seen. He hummed a tune. Suddenly, Ichabod saw a light rising from the ground of the cemetery. He stopped, heart pounding in fear. That's 40 seconds, and you'll have to go to the website for more. And this is my second video excerpt from my quarantine vlog, which I named the Quarantine Diaries. And you'll get 40 seconds of this as well. I wake up around 7.40 in the morning. Technically, that's when school starts, but since I didn't have a class yet, I slept in. Grandma cleans the house every morning. She's very afraid of the coronavirus. Breakfast was avocados on naan, which is a type of Indian bread. I was very excited because I love avocados. I freshened up for the day. The first class was study hall, so I fooled around for a bit. Next was Western Civ. And you'll have to go to the website for more. I made a quick tutorial on how to draw an Autodesk sketchbook, which I think lots of teachers and students might be interested in. I made this with notability. So if you want to find a reference photo, you'll have to go to Chrome and then save the photo. In this case, I found a picture of Pikachu. And then you would open the, up the app and you have to create a new drawing. You can actually control the dimensions of your drawing. And for this, I just decided to go a normal eight by 11 horizontal type picture. To insert a photo, you would choose the photo one and you would add it in. There's also a variety of colors and pens and styluses to choose from. This is, you have to experiment with it. 
I tend to like to use the spray painting tool a lot, but everyone's different. So you should definitely see which ones you like. There's something interesting out of this sketchbook called layers, where you can control which layers that you see and which layers you don't. You would just press the I, and then you would just start drawing. To save the drawing, you would press the button in this right corner, on the right corner, and choose which choose how you want to share it. You can save it, you can add it to another app, add it to Drive, print it, anything basically. And for teachers, you might like to use it for making diagrams, but I use it a lot to study for labeling diagrams, labeling maps, drawing diagrams. There's a lot of uses for it, and I think that you might find it interesting. So where do I go from here now that my project is over? Introducing Teen Talks, my sort of not quite registered nonprofit organization. My brother and I just recently started it and we provide English tutoring for students in China. My hope is that I can continue making these types of videos and I'll probably be focusing on blogs because those are less time consuming to make and I want to post it online or I want to use it when I'm teaching. And I'm hoping that through Teen Talks, I can do more of this. Teen Talks right now is just having conversations with Chinese students. And I'm hoping that by doing this, I can continue teaching and help Chinese students to improve their English proficiency, and also to become more comfortable with American culture and just the English language in general. And I know that no matter what I do, I definitely won't stop teaching. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Hello, my name is Brenna, and this is my Achievers Project. A little bit about me, I have been studying Shaolin Kempo Karate at the Darien Art Center for 10 years and have achieved the rank of first degree black belt Shodan. In addition to karate, I enjoy doing photography, art, and playing with my dog, Maisie. For my project, I decided to combine my passions of martial arts and video production. I researched two styles of martial arts, Tai Chi and Shaolin Kempo Karate, learned movements and forms in each, filmed videos about both, edited them, and uploaded them to a website. I wanted to educate people on the benefits and details of martial arts and teach at a beginner and more advanced level. This is a brief introductory video. So my project definitely evolved a lot over the course of the year. So I started um, the year thinking I was gonna create a series of videos teaching meditation and how martial arts practitioners could apply that to their practice. However, after meeting with my mentors and doing a bit more research, I discovered that kind of the gray area between karate and meditation uh, were styles of, tai, of karate, martial arts called Tai Chi and Qigong. Um, I, from there, I wanted to make a series of videos teaching beginner movements in that style and advanced forms. 
However, then uh, the pandemic happened and I was unable to go learn Tai Chi and Qigong, which are two styles that I am unfamiliar with. So I decided to kind of uh, take my two previous goals and kind of combine them into what is now my final project. So now I have a series of videos highlighting my research about both styles and teaching in both those styles as well. My project was very heavily technology based. Uh, one of the apps or resources I used was iMovie, which was very helpful for editing my videos. Second, I used Autodesk Sketchbook, which is an online drawing app. And I used this to create some of the graphics for my research videos. In addition to Sketchbook, I also used Pixlr, which is an online image editor. Uh, it allows you to take out the background of any image, which I thought was helpful for making my video is more professional and making the graphics uh, more tied into the presentation. And lastly, YouTube. YouTube kind of saved my project um, due to the pandemic. Like I said, I was unable to go learn Tai Chi. So I found some YouTube tutorials and spent some time watching those to become familiar with the style. Project reflection. The most challenging part for me, like I've mentioned, was learning Tai Chi. Due to the pandemic, I was forced to resort to YouTube, like I said. And editing was also very time consuming and I encountered some technical difficulties with Wi-Fi and storage and things like that. Uh, the least challenging part for me was teaching um, about Shaolin Kempo and teaching forms in Shaolin Kempo because I have lots of experience doing so. Uh, this is a sneak peek at my website. You can go visit that and look at kind of what the layout of it is. So this is my homepage. Uh, this is where you can find this presentation that I'm going through right now, um, as well as some basic information about the program. Uh, over here we have About Me, which is basically the video you saw, a little biography, autobiography about me. This is about my project, a little more behind the reason why I wanted to do the project and things like that, and an outline of my videos. Uh, here you can also find the introductory video that we just watched. And here, here is my final project, my, uh, actually more like six videos. So my first video is about Tai Chi and Qigong, a research video. My second video is beginner Tai Chi. Third video about Shaolin Kempo Karate, another research video. And videos four and five are blocking systems in Shaolin Kempo. Lastly, this is a bonus video that I did for my podcast, Keep Calm and Karate On. And this is kind of a foundational video um, to help with videos number four and five. So I just link that here as an additional resource. And lastly, I have my Works Cited page. Uh, these are a lot of the videos and websites that I found helpful for my research. If I wanted to take my project further, I could learn about other styles of martial arts like Taekwondo or Jiu Jitsu. I could teach more Tai Chi and Qigong or Shaolin Kempo and can kind of continue uh, the direction my videos are heading in right now. Or I could learn about and teach meditation and how to apply it to martial arts practice like I was planning on doing in the beginning of the year. I wanted to give a huge shout out to my mentors, uh, Masters Bonnie and James Gombos. Uh, thank you for mentoring me throughout this process and for teaching me all I know over the past 10 years. Here's some other acknowledgments. Uh, Master Nancy Simon, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge about Tai Chi with me and being willing to talk and share uh, what you know about the style. This is Karen Kerr, thank you for encouraging me to join the IDEA program back in fourth grade. And lastly, my friend Isabel, thank you for inspiring me to join ninth grade IDEA. Thank you for watching. And lastly, I thought it would be fun to teach some uh, karate for my presentation. So we're going to do, let me unshare my screen so you can see me. We're going to learn what is called a crossover sidekick. So, crossover sidekick is basically a sidekick, but with a step for more power. Let's tilt the step. I'm going to kick with my right foot. You're welcome to kick with your left, but I find it easier to kick with my dominant foot. So I'm going to be kicking towards this wall over here. So I'm going to have my right foot, my kicking foot, towards that wall in like a relaxed shoulder with a part kind of stance. From here, I'm going to have my hands up. I'm going to take my back foot, the foot I'm not going to kick with, and I'm going to step behind and point my heel towards my target. So again, take your back foot, step behind. And when you're doing this, it's important to point your heel towards your target. 
so that when you step down, you are facing in the proper direction to extend and kick. So once again, come back, foot spring to where you want to kick, put that foot flat on the ground. And from here, my body is facing um, the exact opposite direction of where I want to kick when I'm looking at my target. And when you're looking at your target, it's important to turn at the waist and twist your body rather than just look over your shoulder. So now that we're here, we're going to put all our weight onto our non-kicking foot. Maybe we'll walk a little bit. We're going to bring our kicking foot, in this case my right foot, up into chamber. So chamber is useful because it helps you balance before you extend your kick. And it's also useful because when I'm in this position, my opponent doesn't know how I'm going to kick. They don't know if I'm going to go straight or around, or I could even switch legs and kick. So that's why we use chamber. So here I have my chamber. I like prefer to do my foot flex for this kick because I'm going to be pushing out with a flex foot. And then here is where the actual kick comes in. So we're going to push our kicking foot, my right foot, back. And you're going to push out with the heel of your foot in the side kick. You're also going to have your toes, in my case, pointing forward so that the outside of my foot is parallel with the floor and the ceiling. Also, when I'm here, I want to have my hands up on guard and out to defend against any attacks I might encounter while in this kick. Chamber and step down. So let's do that again. Back, point your foot, step up into chamber, push out with the heel of your foot, making sure that your toes are pointing forward, hands up on guard, and back into chamber and down. So in fast motion, the crossover side kick should look like this. And that's it. Now you have a new karate move that you can practice. Thank you so much for watching. Um, I'll see you next time. Bye. Hello everyone, I'm Lily. This year for the Ninth Grade Achievers program, I wrote a novella entitled, Holding the Sky. Let me introduce myself. I'm Lily Coles and I've been in the IDEA program since fourth grade. I've always loved to write and from as early as third grade, I've known that I wanted to be an author. This year I was given the opportunity to pursue an independent project and immediately I decided I would write a novella. For the full plot, you're gonna to have to read my book, but I'll give you a brief summary. Naomi is a high school senior who lives with her single mother from whom she feels emotionally isolated. Filled with the resentment for the father who left when she was seven, Naomi is furious when she is forced to spend her Thanksgiving holiday with him and his new fiance. However, when tragedy strikes, Grief compels Naomi to reconsider the resentment and detachment she has lived with for so long. In the beginning of the year, we all began our project with some research. For me, that meant looking at interviews with authors or reading up on tips for writers. In October, Ms. Boston and I sat down to discuss my research so far, and we realized that it was not working out so well. So I switched my focus to more creative research, answering writing prompts I found on poetsandwriters.org and starting to build up my character and plot. Even though I started figuring out a vague idea of plot in October, it wasn't until December, about a month into writing, when I really settled on my main plot points. Another way my project evolved was I thought I'd have the chance to edit. That was very wrong. I was able to fix a few things based on feedback from my amazing mentor, April Stevens, who has helped me so much, from Tessa Rupture, whom I'm grateful to have as a local author, and for my classmates and teacher, who are also pretty amazing. But I never sat down and started intensely revising, which had been my expectation. What I did do was design cover art. Thank you to Olivia Boston, who helped me make it about 10 times better. I wasn't originally planning on making it, but I figured to make everything look nice, why not? I used a sketchbook on my iPad with a reference photo of myself holding a marble. This part might have been the most challenging, since I'm not really an artist and I also didn't have a clear direction. In the book, I'm purposely ambiguous about my character's appearance, so to put her on the cover kind of scared me, but I was very happy with the results. I'm so lucky that quarantine did not affect my project in any other way than how I'm presenting it to you now. Unlike my classmates, I did not use any fancy apps or tools with this project. I used Google Docs to write the novella itself and ordered a sketchbook to create the cover art. I have a lot of symbols. Major ones are the marbles, 
frost, and poppies. The marble's meaning evolves as Naomi's story does, always a reminder of her old life, but that comes to mean different things. Frost is symbolic of the brevity of beauty, and poppies are consistently associated with her father. It was interesting to me, as someone who's never written anything this long before, all the little ways you find to work the symbols in. I'd love to read for you a short excerpt. I'll start with the first couple of pages, which introduce my character, her voice, and a little bit of her situation, then take you to a little bit later in the chapter. <laughs> it was the day I lost my marbles. I guess lost wasn't quite the right word. It suggested something accidental. And this wasn't, not entirely at least. I had one for each year of my life, seven, which wasn't the same number of years I'd been alive. There was a difference, not one most people would notice, but then most people's lives lasted as long as they were alive. Being alive was a rectangle or maybe a rhombus. I think a rhombus. Life was a square. Most people had squares, which were also rhombi, but with four 90 degree angles. I used to have a square, but then my life was skewed a little, and all those perfect right angles turned wrong angles. I was left with only a rhombus. I had one marble for each year my life was a square, when I still had a family that would go on trips during summer vacation, places where we seek out those sort of oddity stores where overpriced marbles were sold. Not the type people play marbles with, or the type that go, go down the tall, rickety marble runs I'd build from a set with a bunch of plastic pieces when I was a kid. No, these were quality marbles. Hand-painted, or made out of blown glass, or real stone, or whatever else you use to make something quality. When I was still too little to choose one myself, my parents would choose for me. But by the time I was three, I could point with a chubby hand, brown with the sun, towards whatever marble I wanted to add to my collection. It was an odd tradition, but it was our tradition, and that was what made me love it. There wasn't a lot left that was ours, so I held on tight to what there was still to be held. I did that with the marbles too, until I lost them. Of course, it wasn't completely my fault, but I suppose it was enough my fault it could be called that. It was cold. Not quite the mind numbing cold that was the only thing you could think about. Not the type of cold where your breath materializes in front of you in a little white puff. Not yet, anyway. It was just cold enough that I pulled my jacket around me tighter. Too cold for early November, or I thought so anyway. The bus had just pulled away, leaving me in a gray cloud of exhaust behind it. I walked down my street, the heels of my boots crushing brittle brown leaves. Only a few still clung to the trees, clung to color clung to life. Life and color, two things that seemed impossible to separate. That was one way you could tell right away my home was dead. The little paint that was left had faded to a dull, dark white, peeling from the siding in small curls. The door used to be navy, and it still was, but only in places. Even the windows were covered in a thin layer of grime, blocking the light, which was what color was the visible spectrum of light. The grass surrounding the house was only the idea of green, not the real thing. Every morning, frost would catch on each blade, shimmering like tiny jewels. I could see the beauty in things, even if I knew that beauty wasn't usually there. And when it was, you had to squint to find it. I saw the beauty in the frost. Frost wasn't just beautiful. It was beauty. Shining. Colds, ephemeral. I walked across the grass, which the beauty had all melted off of by now, towards the door that was once navy, and dumped my backpack on the stone step right beneath it to rummage through the bag. There was a chip in the stone, but it was small enough you wouldn't notice if you weren't looking for it. Finally, I found what I was looking for. I turned the key in the lock, waiting to hear the soft click before pulling it open. It was Friday 
which meant my mom was out working a shift at the diner. My dad wasn't here. He never was. He hadn't been for a long time. Now I'll jump to later in the chapter. She takes the marbles and on an impulse, decides she needs to bury them. I walked through the small backyard to get to the apple tree. Standing under it, I could see the smoke gray sky crisscrossed by the gnarled boughs. But it wasn't time for me to be looking up. It was time for me to be looking down. I knelt in the brown grass, careful not to sit on one of the mushy apples. I felt the moisture from the grass color the knees of my jeans a shade darker. I hadn't brought a shovel or a trowel or whatever that gardening thing is called. Stupid of me, but my hands would do. I started scraping away the top layer of frostbitten dirt, green sticking beneath my fingernails. Eventually, a shallow dent formed, revealing earth that was softer, protected from the stiffening cold. I scooped it out by the handful, determined to make a hole large enough to bury everything I wanted gone. That would be a hole too large to dig, though. So I decided to settle for one at least big enough for the marbles. Soon it was there, the walls soft, a trickle of dirt sliding down them, but deep enough to bury those small globes in. I picked up the jar from where it was nestled in the pile of dirt and held it over the hole, hesitating. But they need to go. 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 So they went. Where am I going from here? This has been an amazing experience for me and it has confirmed that writing is something I'm interested in doing. I would love to possibly enter my work into a competition or find somewhere to publish it online. Finally, if you're interested in reading the full novella on your own time, you can find it on our website. I'm grateful to so many people for helping me along the way. First would be, once more, my mentor, April Stevens, for talking with me about my ideas and how to improve my writing. Thank you also to Tessa Rapture for reading a few chapters and giving me feedback, to Olivia Boston for helping move the cover art, to Miss Graham and all my other English teachers for helping to make me a better writer. Thank you to my family for believing in me. And finally, thank you to Miss Boston, Desi, Brenna, and Sophie for their feedback and support the whole way through. Project. For anyone who doesn't know me, my name's Desi. I've been in the IDEA program since the fourth grade. Every year since then, I've gone to my grandparents' house over the summer in Bulgaria and made a mini movie or trailer on iMovie for my grandma's birthday. This inspired me to do the same thing, but with a real storyline throughout the course of the year. I was going to create a movie that showed people the life of a teenager with a so-called technology addiction, like myself. Unfortunately, among other things, Corona ruined this, so it's time to switch my project around. Here's a quick timeline of my project. On August 28th, school started and I met my idea class for the first time. I had no idea what I was planning on doing for my project and I was kind of worried about it. On November 7th, I would figured out my project and decided that I was going to create a, short, a more professional short movie like the ones my cousin and I had made over the summer. On February 3rd, I started working on my script, planning to have a 10-page script that would follow the life of a high schooler. After multiple peer reviews and a lot of hours of hard work, I finished my script on March 7th and got ready to show it to the film club. Unfortunately, as you guys know, schools were closed down March 12th, and so I realized I could no longer film a short movie. For about a week, I had no idea what would happen with Achievers Night or my project. But then we had our first class on March 23rd, and I was off again, starting my new project, a series of podcasts highlighting the same issues I wanted to emphasize in my movie. After figuring out my script and format, I released my first new podcast about four weeks later, and I was really proud of it. This all made me think, what if I still teach people about technology addiction, but more directly? So I decided to create a podcast, focusing on the same issues as before, but following my life instead. Here's my trailer. 
So it's no mystery that these days, everything is online. From shopping to communication. And in the future, we're only going to rely on it more. Results from a survey from Common Sense Media read that just over half of children in the United States now own their own smartphone by the age of 11. We need to now, more than ever, understand their effects. This is why, in my podcast, Essie's Digital Detox, I'm going to explore the psychology behind our alliance on the internet. Through this podcast, I'll be learning to use my own phone less and less. Every Thursday when I release a new episode, you can expect me to have a new challenge for myself. My aim through this is to educate my listeners and share my own experiences. Together, we can learn about the nuances of technology and how it really affects our brains. So put on your headphones and listen to my podcast on your phone while I stop using my phone. Here are some well-phrased reviews about my podcast. Emily Boston says, Love the drawing fun facts. One of my favorite things is when you go into the psychology of app usage. Lily Cole says, The fun facts in psychology were really interesting. Daniel Brailsford says, I really liked your podcast. Like, I just sat there and listened to it. It's hella relaxing. And finally, Christopher Gale said, Honestly, it wasn't the worst podcast I've listened to. Just kidding. He actually said, It gave me a lot of insight into teen sec- and technology addiction. My favorite part was probably the challenge section. On the next slide, I'll highlight some of my results from my podcast. So let me quickly explain the format to anyone who hasn't heard it yet. So at the beginning of every podcast, I explain the format in the intro for my new reviewers. Then I have my challenge section, where I explain the challenge for that week, which is usually me not using it out for a whole day, which ranges from social media to gaming. After that, I have my fun facts, where I share some interesting facts about whatever the activity is for that day. My activity is what I do instead of whatever app I quit using. It's usually educational or just fun. Then I continue into my check-in point, where I talk about how the activity is going. Then, a favor of mine, which is research, where I explain why the app is so addicting. Finally, I have my reflection, where I talk about the overall experience, and then it's my outro, which is just a short segment for me to transition into the end. So here are the results of some of my podcasts. First, we have a beautiful puzzle I assembled, which took a while. This took place in episode 6. Next, we have some banana bread I made the other day which is already almost finished, so ignore the small quantity. I didn't get a chance to take a photo of my chocolate chip cookies, but those were in the first episode. Then on the bottom left is my nice drawing of a sunflower that I did in the second episode. Finally, there's my room, after I organized and redecorated it. As you can see, I have the LED lights and a nice sunflower tapestry, and my photos on the wall also happen in the fourth episode. And now I'm going to teach you guys how you can make your own podcast. So first, download the app Anchor. This is a free platform owned by Spotify that allows anyone to make their own podcast and even earn money from it. I personally didn't use any sponsorships because this is a school project. Also, and uh, one of my fellow idea classmates, Brenna, got a really sketchy offer, so I turned that feature off. It also has other cool features like a call-in, where you can put in voicemails from other people. Two, figure out who your audience is and what you want to share with them. I just used the same idea I was going to use for my short movie, but for a new creator, it'll be completely up to you. I also tailored my content for a more teenage audience, being one myself. 3. Come up with a name and logo. I designed mine on a logo-making website and then photoshopped out the watermarks. That's why the quality of it isn't as good, but I like it, so that's really all that matters. Make sure it looks professional, though, because no one wants to listen to someone who can't even put in the effort to make a logo. 4. Script and then record your first episode. This part is more of a personal choice because I find it easier to read off of a script and make it sound more personal while reading it. Others may prefer to improvise it though, because even then, but even then, small notes can be helpful. A little tip though, remember to not get upset if it takes multiple takes to record one segment, and make sure it's conversational. 5. Make a trailer and distribute it. Luckily, Anchor has a special feature that helps you make a professional looking trailer as you guys saw my own. Again, if you want to, you can also design your own. I just used the one offered because I like the style, and I wanted to see what else Anchor offered. Creating a trailer is also a whole separate ball game, so look into that before you make one. There's a lot of articles online that can help. 6. Finally, maintain a release schedule. 
This is necessary if you want to maintain listeners, because this way they know exactly when to expect a new episode. For me, I decided to do one weekly, every Thursday. Moving forward. I learned a lot from making my podcast, but moving forward, if I do decide to make another podcast, it'll probably be completely different. I'm glad, though, that even though my project completely changed, I'll be able to apply everything I've learned in the future. This project taught me a lot about engaging an audience and teaching people while keeping it entertaining. Overall, I would totally take the chance to make another podcast, if offered. Lastly, I'd like to thank the entire Idea Squad. Thanks for helping me figure out my new project and giving me feedback on my old script and current podcasts. I can't wait to see you guys in person again. Miss Grimm, thanks for being my mentor and helping me with my script and short movie overall. Even though I didn't get a chance to film it, I'll always remember the cardboard phones. Finally, my family. Thanks for being my biggest fan throughout and listening to every single podcast right as it came out.